Welcome to Darren Batchelder's Real Estate Investing Show. Each week, you will learn how to grow your wealth through real estate investing, be introduced to the players that are getting it done, and learn how you can get involved. And now, here's your host, Darren Batchelder. Hello, everyone. Today, we have a very special guest with us here today. We've got Matt Faircloth. Matt, appreciate you coming on the show. Darren, it's an honor to be here. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So just a little bit on how I know Matt. Um, This is actually the first time that we're talking to each other, um, but I know of Matt from social media. I also read his book. He's got, and we'll talk about his book, uh, Raising Private Capital. And um, actually, I, I didn't mention this to you before we hit record, but I did see on Facebook today that he, he and his wife are celebrating their anniversary. So how many years, my friend? 16. 16 years. Congratulations. Yeah. That's Thank fantastic. You. That's yeah. fantastic. Um, well, I appreciate you spending the time with us today. Um, you know, first question typically ask is how many properties and how many units are you invested in? Sure. Uh, we've done, um, let's see, we've sold a lot too. Uh, we currently hold around 1,350 doors, uh, of mostly multifamily and, and also in there is an office complex that I just count how many offices are in the building. Um, and that, so that, that's where we are unit count wise, um, property wise, that's something like seven, uh, assets, um, that are the smallest one is a 300, the largest one is a 336 unit in North Carolina. The smallest one in there, um, is a four family. That's a, it's, um, three apartments and a, uh, storefront. Awesome. Awesome. That's yeah, it. Yeah. Full, full range. And we've done a lot of, a lot of everything in between too. Fantastic. So, um, to start, maybe I know, I know I read your book and we're going to get into that. Um, but you know, how did you actually get into real estate? What was your background beforehand? Why did you even do it? Um, good question. I, uh, I didn't know what I wanted to be when I grew up and I, I was, um, and that even went back into my teens, you know, like when I was growing up, I knew I was good at math and science and I went to a math and science oriented high school, you know, like it was a magnet school. Um, and people are like, oh, you're good at math and science. You should be an engineer. And I said, okay, I'll, that's what I'll do. Like, I'm 16 years old and I have no idea what I'm to do with myself. So I'll just do what the grown ups say and they want me to go be an engineer. So that's what I'll do. So I got into Virginia Tech because it's where, and I applied there because it's where one of my dad's friends went to college and he was a heavy pusher of the Hokies on me. And so I good, good engineering to, school, right? Great engineering school, great engineering school, a lot of fun, a lot of camaraderie, a lot of social scene. Exactly what I you know w- you know wouldn't have changed a minute of it. Sure. Um, and uh, and had a great time and got a great degree, but when I graduated, I didn't know. I still didn't know what an engineer did. I just knew that it involved a lot of math and a lot of science because that's what I took, you know, thermo and physics and uh, all any kind of different level of calculus you can think of I took, right? So um, when I saw what an engineer did and I met from meeting field engineers that were these guys in factories or gals in factories that were just talking about how things got designed and efficiencies and operational stuff. Like, oh, I, I don't want to do that, though. So it doesn't didn't speak to me. And I developed a love of people and a personality that enabled that really was very extroverted and stuff like that through college. And so I took a job in sales um, and I was in technical sales for years, um, got very good at it, uh, traveled around a bit and um, found myself in Philadelphia and met my um, met my girlfriend now wife who put rich dad poor dad in my hand oh fantastic that yeah. that book man has started out so many people it's incredible he was just on the bigger pockets podcast and brandon turner said that to him i was like i have no idea how many entrepreneurs you created or people who quit their job because of your book you know um and I, most people i know that's how they got started they read rich dad poor dad it changed their mindset on everything and then they quit their job to, because they just couldn't go back to work after reading that book. Right. You know? Right. Well, I appreciate that. So, so at that point you're in technical sales and you meet your, you know, now wife, girlfriend, now wife. Um, how did you end up getting in, you know, deciding to do real estate? Um, well, it's just through, I mean, 
Rich Dad Poor Dad, Robert Kiyosaki in that book talks a lot about investing. Um, he's a big real estate guy, so that got sure. us into real estate. Uh, so we started attending a lot of local RIA meetings, um, took a few uh, classes and stuff like that. So went that path while we were dating, um, started buying rental properties while we were dating um in that so uh so that that was a road that liz and i went down which was which was great we're glad we did that uh and then by the time that we had a few properties lined up and i was living in one of our rentals right a few few of my old a uh, few of my friends paying me rent for the house i lived in um and that then when i um when we got married we figured out that it would be just a, a risk that we wanted to take for me to quit my job uh at ingersoll ran which is where i worked to uh, to go and, and, and start up our company, to, to start up a real estate investing business full time. And so I decided that was a risk I wanted to take and I did and it worked out. I mean, that's and that, that was 2005. Fantastic, fantastic. So yeah. um, your book, Raising Private Capital, um, you know, I've read, you know, I've read other books that are on syndication financing and, and whatnot, and you cover that in the book. But one of the things that I thought was interesting was that um, it sounded like you started out you know, in smaller deals and then you kind of, you know, learned and then kind of grew and, and then the, you know, the financing sources changed as you went to different deals and you talk about all those different levels. So, you know, it, this book can really help somebody right from the get go, you know, getting into a duplex or, mm -hmm. you know, um, versus, just being focused on like large scale syndication. So yeah, I thought that was, was that was interesting to do that. And, and, I, and I people like in this day and age, Darren, people are forgetting that there's actually other types of real estate you can own besides an apartment building, because that's not, that's all anybody ever wants to buy right now. Is, I will buy multifamily. Well, you can actually buy a small single. You can buy single families. You can buy a small multi. You can buy, you know, mid sized stuff doesn't have to be a 200 unit apartment complex and it's, it's it's you know complexes are apartment complexes are complex you know and little single family homes and onesie twosie deals are way more simple and you don't have a bunch of investors on board with you you can just borrow the money as i talk about in the book um so i believe that that uh smaller real estate is a great way to get going and i have friends that do very very well that that uh, have never syndicated and they have over 200 units and they just use the Burr strategy over and over and over again. Um, and they, they do very well for themselves um, without ever having to sell any equity, without ever having to, to get that diluted or any of that kind of stuff. So there's a, a real path to financial success in real estate that doesn't involve multifamily or self storage or mobile home parks, you know, that's, uh, yeah. you know, that's a point, you know, look, there's listeners on the, uh, that listen to this show that are just looking to get started and trying to figure it out. And then there's listeners that are, you know, they're in the deal and they, they want to ramp up. And so, you know, one of the things, and I have a lot of syndicators that come on that have done 1000, 2000, 3000 units and I think it's important to understand, look, everybody has a different mindset. Everybody has a different comfort level of how they can get in the game. Uh, for me, you know, my first deal was a, was a new construction duplex. Mm -hmm. And then the next deal was a 76 unit townhome community. But, you know, I don't think I could have gone right. I didn't, my mind wasn't there to go right to the 76 unit, you know? So mm -hmm. doing the duplex like taught me a lot and then, and then helped me move on. So look, I put together a lot of notes on, on uh, your book. We're not going to be able to cover it all, but let me uh, just hit on some points, you know? So uh, one, you talk about capital preservation, you know, a lot of investors, that's, you know, one of their top things is that they don't want to lose money. So yeah. talk, talk about that and, and why you think real estate is a good area um, for capital preservation. Well, it's, it's interesting because um, people forget that I'm talking people, I mean, like deal providers and my, in the language of raising private capital that I use is a deal provider and a cash provider. And the deal providers, meaning the person that's, you know, you know us out there finding opportunities that they need capital from uh, cash providers to, to invest in. You forget why people invest, right? And a lot of people invest not necessarily so I can make a 15% IRR, so I can make all this cash flow, so I can make this and make that. Well, that has nothing to do with those things. It has to do with I, I need to put my cash somewhere else besides Wall Street because I already have a bunch of money in Wall Street already. 
and I want to get a little, I want to get true diversification. A, I'm worried about inflation, B, right? Uh, about the cost of a gallon of milk becoming a lot more next year than it is today, or a gallon of gas or whatever. Um, and the way around these things is to buy assets, buy not buy assets outside of Wall Street. And it's, you know, Robert Kiyosaki uh, 101. I mean, assets produce cash flow and real estate is one of the best assets you can, you can pick up out there, which to your question earlier, that's why we got involved in real estate is because it's one of the best asset classes you can invest in because of the tax advantages, because of the way and the means you can leverage it, because of all the different uh, benefits that it has. Um, th that's why I think it's a great asset. And I think that I love explaining that to our passive investors when they come in is about the, uh, the uh, you know, ideal. You've heard, probably heard that one, right? I-D-E-A-L. Um, which is interest, interest, uh, the, the, right off the interest D for depreciation E for, um, I'm going to try and get all these, right. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just forgot E, I think it's that you can write off your expenses on the property. Um, a that it appreciates and L you can, uh, you can write it off what you can use leverage, uh, to, uh, to you know, take on debt, to buy it. Um, so it is ideal. And that's why I love explaining that to passive investors that don't understand the business yet to, to go through it with them. Yeah. I, I, you hit on two points that I think uh, that are different, um, than say investing in the stock market that have huge advantages. One is leverage and two, two is depreciation. Depreciation, you know, is not a cash expense, but you get to uh, have a write off for it. And a lot mm -hmm. of people end up having a loss when they actually had positive cash flow. Right. Um, what other investment is there where you can tell the IRS you lost money, but you really made legally tell the yes. IRS you lost money right. and then you legally made money, right? Yeah. What else is there out there like that? It's, I mean, it's, nothing it's, I've ever seen. Now there's this oil and gas, there's other stuff that's more complex uh, that has tax leverage to it. Don't get me, don't get me wrong. That is there elsewhere. Right. But it's still pretty cool. You know, it's that you it's can phenomenal. That. I can borrow my, I can borrow against the hard asset, you know, uh, the sticks and bricks. And some people don't bricks. understand. Well, what's the benefit of that? Well, you know, look, if you're in, you're buying a stock, you're buying Amazon stock, and you put fifty thousand dollars or ten thousand dollars into the stock, in order for it to, you know, have a hundred percent return, that fifty thousand dollars has to turn into a hundred thousand dollars, but. Mm -hmm. You know, on these real estate deals, if you have 70 or 80 percent leverage, all of the gain goes back to the equity owners. So yeah. you just pay back the loan. So you're getting appreciation on basically, you know, the, the loaned amount um, is yeah. that's all going back to the equity owner. So you don't have to double the value of the property to get a double in your investment. Mm hmm. You know, that's what's great about it. And in buying stock and things like that, yeah, you know, Bitcoin moves up 25% a day, um, but it can also drop that. And we, real estate will not, it does not fluctuate like uh, paper assets do because it's hard to trade it. Because that's one of the reasons why you can borrow against it is because the value of real estate, even though you see it go up and up and up or down or whatever, it's fairly fixed as compared to other asset classes. And that's be, and, and that is because it's hard to trade. You can't just sell real estate in a day. Right. You can't sell real estate in two days or a week. It takes probably two to three months to trade real estate. So when you do that, it takes the emotion out of it. And it takes the panic sale or the holy crap, it's going to go up or holy crap, it's going to go down right, out of real estate. And it normalizes the price a lot more than other asset classes have normalization of price. I, I completely agree. I mean, if you think back at what happened in 2020 with COVID, there was two or three weeks where the stock market was just tanking every day, but all my real estate transactions, I don't have a ticker symbol. So, yeah. you know, it's, it, it, I didn't see the valuation going down. You know, I knew, I knew we were, we were going to have no some, ch some challenges, whatnot. A, yeah. You can't push a panic button on right. real estate and, and dump sell it. You know, I mean, I know people whose closings got thrown out the window because of COVID, uh, I know a lot of bad things that happened, but it was short lived, um, and it, it uh, damaged things differently than the stock market crash did. And in, in, in a sale like that, uh, which just can't happen in real estate, which is what's great, and that what's that's what creates leverage because of that stability and in, in valuation. That's why banks are willing to put money on it because right? right. they can they can collateralize it and know that it's not going to just get cut in half in price in a day. Yeah, absolutely. So another thing you talk about in the book is. 
you know, um, when you're going out talking to investors in, in whatever type of transaction, whether it's a smaller deal or a larger deal, um, you know, people don't realize the money that they have available to them, you know, as investors. So talk mm-hmm. about, you know, you know, where do people find capital that they didn't know that they had that they can leverage? That's one of the best things that I probably one of my joys in what I do in, in offering what I offer to people is in opening up levels of possibility that people didn't realize were there. Because a lot of times people want to invest with us. We get like, hey, I want to put some, you know, put some cash to work. It's almost always in hard cash that they have. Um, they may have had a windfall or maybe been really smart to be able to be able to save it up. Whatever happened, they've got something they want to put to work, right? Sure. Um, and in raising private capital, I talk about the three sources of capital, which are cash right there. Uh, and then real estate equity, and then in retirement accounts. Um, and, you know, a lot of America's homes are paid off. 30% of America's single, of America's primary residences, not secondary residences, not rental properties, but 30% of America's single family homes are owned free and clear. Um, and that's thanks to, you know, baby boomers being fiscally responsible for those that did, or for those that have just been really diligent about paying their home mortgage off or listen to Dave Ramsey or whatever and just got themselves out of personal debt. A lot of homes are free and clear. Uh, that home, that free and clear home could be leveraged um, on like a 2.5% uh, HELOC right now, home equity line of credit. And then that 2.5% money cost of capital could get put into something yielding 9, 10, 11%. And the homeowner gets to make all that yield spread. It's the best piggy bank ever invented. Uh, being a, bar- a borrowing in, in, a, in a home equity line like that. Um, maybe only second to a whole life insurance policy. You know? um, but it's, it's one of those great ways for people to leverage something that they've paid down and built and make a great yield spread for themselves. Yeah, uh, so a, let, let's talk yeah. about that just a little sure. bit because you know the people that have paid, because that's one of the financial things that's talked about a lot. Pay down your house. Pay down your house. Don't have a mortgage. Don't have a mortgage. The parties, Darren, you know, where they go and they have like, they, they'll burn the, the burn, mortgage. Burning their mortgage. Right. Yeah. So you know, like, I, and yeah. you know, so there's a, there's a thought process out there that that's the smart thing to do. And then mm-hmm. there's other people and you're one of them that believes that, Hey, look, there's, there's all this dead equity in your home mm-hmm. that you can leverage. And you know, so what you mentioned was, all right, if you took out a home equity line and two and a half percent, and then you got, um, you know, you know, a lot of the multifamily deals I see are seven, eight percent cash flow and, you know, mm-hmm. mid teens total return o- overall. But, you know, if you double the, I mean, even if you got a five percent cash flow, you're doubling the cash flow, you pay up, pay off the, the interest on the, on mm-hmm. the mortgage. And then, you have two assets. I think that that's part of where people don't understand is now they have two assets. If the original home, let's say the original home was a million dollars. Well, if over the next five years it goes up a hundred thousand, you're still going to make that hundred thousand, whether you had that HELOC and you own another investment or not. Mm Mm-hmm. You know, so now you've got multiple assets working for you instead of one. And I think that that's the the part that people have a hard time grasping because, you know, it's also about people telling you like, that's risky, you know, Um, they, and those people that are giving you that advice are the ones that haven't done it. Yeah. Yeah. I know. They they don't, they don't know. They don't know what real risk is, you know, Um, uh, risk is not the potential to lose. Risk is like the unknown thing that you didn't think of blindsiding you. Risk is the person who's been working at a job for 15 years getting laid off, right? At, that people think old. is just bad That's luck, risk. right? Yeah. That, but I agree that that, you know, look, you get into your 40s and 50s and you're at, you're, you know, your salary is, is at risk, yeah. you know, to the younger That's guys cool, coming right? in. Yeah. Uh, by the way, back to your point about yeah. the HELOC. I would not rec- – I've had many people that come like, hey, I've got a HELOC or some equity in my home. Can I invest in one of your syndications? And I typically will discuss that with them in a lot of detail before I'll allow them to do it. And here's why. Yeah, it's awesome. <laughs> Syndications are not guaranteed to pay that monthly payment, right? right. Uh, they endeavor to. 
you know, to, to make that monthly pref. Um, and they, but the property, if, if they now there's syndicators out there that are going to pay you that pref no matter what, because they don't want to look bad or they don't want you, to, they don't want you to see what's going on behind the curtain. They over raise and start paying right away. Right, they over raise. Yeah, right. yeah, that's, that's a common thing. And yeah. is they over raise enough capital, they can just ride the storm and pay you your money, pay you your pref forever and ever because they've raised enough capital. They can do that. We don't right. do that at Thoreau. So we pay the pref truly out of cash flow from the property. Um, in that. And so, um, what, uh, what, what I, and if the property's not cash flowing, we don't pay a pref. So right. there's no guarantee you're going to get it. Now you, you think that there is, but there's not. So what I recommend people do is with a HELOC that they have is to put that money into secondary debt to go and take, yeah, you got debt on your, that, that's that HELOC is a, a debt instrument on your home. You're borrowing that money. I would go and take it and recycle it back into another debt, debt instrument. Let's call it hard money, right? I would go. I, I have a HELOC on my home right now, Darren, for 100k, and I have that. I have that 100k lent to somebody at 12 percent plus three points. Wow! Right. Yeah, that, so I made, I made three points on origination. So the 100k, so I made three thousand dollars for originating the loan, and then I make a thousand dollars a month in interest payments. They they pay me a thousand dollars a month, right? Um, in uh, in interest, and they're glad to do it. This is and, a and you're having to pay deal. two two hundred fifty dollars. What's that? You're having right. to pay two hundred fifty dollars. Yeah, so you're, right. you're yeah, making seven fifty cash flow. Yeah, right. Yeah, I make seven fifty a month in cash flow, and this is just how much I love the game. I don't take that seven fifty and put it in my pocket. You know what I do with it? I take it and I pay my HELOC down with it. So when they send me the thousand, I take the entire thousand and I burn down my HELOC so that my HELOC, my monthly interest payment becomes less and less every month. And it's such a nominal shift; it only saves me like an extra five bucks. But it's only because I love the whole game of compounding interest and, and, uh, and, and, you know, just creating like exponential returns and things like that, that I'm doing it that way. Now the borrower is, you have people that call, man, you're jacking that per borrower per borrower. No, he got a mobile. He, this is the, the loan is on a enormous mobile home park that he got, that he got seller financing on. He came in with 10% capital out of his own pocket and he got the other 10% uh, for me and a few other private lenders. Um, and that, so he is glad to pay me a thousand a month because he's making quite a bit more than that. And the, the park, when he bought it, the, for the price he bought it from will likely double in value after he's done the work that he's doing to the property. So it's a win-win and yeah. a bank wouldn't have touched the deal, you know? Um, but, but it's, it's one of those great arrangements. So I, here's and going all the way back to your original question. The reason why I like that arrangement is because he's under contract through a loan agreement to make me a monthly payment. I got to make a monthly payment too. Right. Um, the syndicate, if you invest with a syndication, they don't have to make you monthly. Pay. They might pay you once a quarter if the deal's profitable, but then you're going to have to pay that interest carry yourself. And I hate negative cash flow, Darren. I, I don't ever, you know, even though however much money I have, I don't want to do deals that take money in my pocket every month. Right. I want to do deals to put money in my money in my pocket, even if it's a little bit. So I like that monthly payment. Uh, concept because I, if I've got to make a monthly payment, I want to get a monthly payment. Does that right. make sense? Yeah, you know? yeah, abso yeah, absolutely. I think that uh, one of the things you said too is is look having the discussion with the investor and understanding yeah. their financial situation. Some people are like, look, that positive cash flow is very important. I need to know that if I move this stuff, you know, pull out a home equity line, I'm going to put it into something that's going to give me that monthly you know, monthly positive cash flow. You want to make other, sure that it's coming from what other you people you may be like, look, I'm, I like the idea of, of having a lot, a bigger return. And I'm, you know, this really isn't a big piece of my portfolio. And so I think it makes sense to, you know, do a syndication and, I mean, if, that. and you know, like, and I, I might have a few months. months that I'm out cash flow, but then all of a sudden I get distribution after three months or six months and that pays it back. Yeah. And I'm, I'm fine with that. There's people that are crazy, negative cash flow zealous. Like I am that are going to be like, Hey Matt, you're telling me all I got to pay is two fifty a month to maintain this loan here. And I can take that money and put it into your deal. And I can put a hundred K in and probably make, you know, a lot more than 250 a month, right? Where do I sign? You know, because they've got plenty of cash flow personally. Now they're probably looking at it the right way. Um, but I just got Kiyosaki in my brain and that <laughs> negative cash flow, just I, I can't do it. So, um, but for but for them, and if I explain it to them properly and they get it, 
then then uh, then they're willing to do it. And they've got plenty of cash reserves and everything like that. They're happy to do that. Uh, to, to have the HELOC invest in the syndication, maintain the monthly payments when there's not a prep paid, and then when the prep gets paid, use it as a catch up. I mean, there, there's plenty of folks that are doing that, and it's a great arrangement too. So, so talk about um, you. You mentioned this phrase in your book, uh, assembler of opportunities, and hmm. you know, I think that especially when you get into syndication, you're raising money from other people. Some people get scared. You know, they get scared that like, and they're focusing on themselves and their, their deal and yeah. they need to get their deal done instead of, you know, talk about how you, how you view it from an opportunity well, guy. Yeah, man. Well, um, I look at it as an opportunity, right? And what we provide as deal providers is a true opportunity to people that don't have the time, the resources, the wherewithal, the contacts, the knowledge, the cojones, the whatever you want to put in there to get out and find their own multifamily deal. And they've tried. Most of the, most of the passives that I talk to are calling us because like, hey man, you guys have figured out some sort of secret equation because I keep trying to find my own deals and it ain't working out. And so I, and I, now I'm out of time and, and I just don't want to put my time in anymore to find loan opportunities. I'd rather just invest with an operator that's doing well. Um, and that's you guys. So that's a lot, in a lot of ways, that's what comes up. But the, the uh, people that are worried about asking for money or like, oh, it's got to get money for my deal. How am I going to get, how am I going to get it or whatever? You're putting the money up on a pedestal, Darren, those people. That's what they're doing. You're putting the money up on, up on, up, up, the, where it's up on a shrine over here from the investor. And it becomes this thing that if you see it of more value than what you're bringing to the equation, you're going to have a hard time raising money. The way I view it and the way I talk about it in raising private capital, it is an equal relationship. What we bring as the deal providers are, well, the deal, but that's, that's leveraged upon my industry experience that I know how to make that deal come to profit. Because it's a deal without profit is nothing. It's just a money pit, right? Um, so I know how to turn that deal into profit through education, through network, through mentorships that I've gotten, and through my network, right? I, I know how to turn a deal into profit. Not everybody knows how to do that. I've got banking relationships, broker relationships, property management relationships, industry experience, long list of contacts. Yada, 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 yada. Make all those things that I have that are non-monetary, right? Um, but not everybody has those things. And the biggest thing I have is time, right? And it's the one limited resource in the whole wide world. It's the one thing we only get so much of in our lives, right? Um, but the, but the, and the, the, almost every investor that shows up to me, Darren, says, geez, I sure wish I could invest in real estate too, but I just don't have the time, Right. So well, I do. I've built yeah, time in my yeah. business. And, yeah. and I'm in agreement with time, but I have, I'm going to add something to it, you know, because I think it's not just time, but it's also you have to be an action taker. Yes. You know, because there's a lot of people that they spend a ton of time analyzing deals, you mm -hmm. know. They do. But yeah, they're paralysis by analysis. And I've also. They can't pull the trigger. Yeah, I'd, I'll turn myself in, man. When I first got going. Um, I took a lot of action, but I also wasn't focused. So maybe let's all, let, let's, let's have fun with this. I think sure. it's time. I think it's, uh, action that it's not just underwriting a bunch of deals. And also I think it's focus. I'll throw those three things in to being the successful to, to the, the, those are the, the success recipes for the successful deal provider. You and I are writing raising private capital book two right now. You know, like this is the sequel right now. The, the, these are the three things that, that I think have to go into a successful deal provider. And the reason why I say focus is because I was that person that, you know, Monday, I'm out looking at raw land deals. Tuesday, I'm out looking for, I'm, I'm looking at a potential wholesale uh, that shows up for me to wholesale the deal to somebody else. Sure. Wednesday, I'm looking at, at a fix and flip. Thursday, I'm looking at a small multifamily apartment building. And Friday, I'm back looking at the land deal again, realizing why it's going to fall apart. So I had a lot of fun, met a lot of people, but I also did got nothing done because I wasn't focused. Right. And I took a lot of action, went a lot of different directions. And uh, I think that with that focus, you know, like Sam Zell, the guy that owns a bajillion apartment building units, I wonder how many fix and flips he's ever done, you right. know? Probably not that many. Right. He probably just stuck into multifamily and, you know, made that and just became became a freight train in that direction and absorbed as many as he could. Yeah, um, I don't know. Did you read his book? I've not yet. It's so, good. Yeah, it, it was good. And, and he, he um, 
really prides his, his success on being creative, you know, so he would find deals that other people couldn't find a solution for, and he would find a solution for it and, and get in mm-hmm. at a good, you know, a good, a good price and they would make good yeah. money and, and form a win-win, you know, for the seller and the buyer. There's a lot of creative financing. I mean, I've done all kinds of creative stuff, everything from like basic stuff, like holding paper. We just did a deal there in, in um, July where we bought the LLC. We didn't buy the building. We didn't buy the property. We bought the LLC that owned the property. How cool is that? That's very cool. So I've heard, I've heard of that before and I've heard of a pro and a con one, yep. the pro being, all right, now you're not going to have the step up in valuation on the property taxes. I don't have to go find, I don't have to go find, I'll give you all the pros. We just did. I know the cons too. We'll talk about those as well. And and that, and I wouldn't do it with anybody, but, but uh, I I wouldn't do it with everybody, but we can get into the cons. Uh, Like you said, no step up valuation on real estate taxes. I don't have to go find a loan because when I'm buying the LLC, I'm buying the debt that's attached to that LLC. So I bought it with good debt in place. Right. Um, You know, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm buying, a something that's already been established, a cash flowing LLC and, and everything like that. Um, you know, and we and we protected ourselves too. But the con, go ahead, what con were you going to say? I've, I've got con, to say I was going to say was um, I had another syndicator on, on that said that they did that and um, there was a lot of undisclosed liabilities with the LLC. So yeah. when they got into it and they were the new owners, they all of a sudden found out that they were liable for all this other stuff that they did, had no idea about. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, and that's like, you know, if you're buying, you're, you're buying an LLC, you're buying that LLC's paper trail, you know um, you're buying everything it's ever done. Any slip and fall, any, you know, lawsuit for anything that's ever happened ever in the world, you're buying and, and lawsuits that have been filed yet or lawsuits for activities that have happened in the past. Um, and so that's why you don't see this done all the time, but in this instance, it made sense. And that here's why, here's my silver bullet, right? The seller is our property manager. Yeah. So you knew, right? you knew them very well. They ain't going nowhere, you right. know, I mean, they're, yeah. and they're a big company, like they're a big multi million dollar company that can afford to pay claims. Now to your audience, here's a little, you know, if you're going to buy an LLC, what we did was uh, we put a indemnification clause in our contract that said they had to indemnify us against lawsuits up to a certain period of time from closing, right? It was years, right? Multiple years in time. Um, and you got to make sure they've got the, the pockets to indemnify you against something significant because you had a $5,000 lawsuit on a big apartment building. Okay, there's worse problems. But somebody shows up with a big six-figure lawsuit or something like that, you got to make sure that the seller um, has the pockets to indemnify you, meaning like to step in and defend you. You could also reach back to their insurance company uh, and that kind of thing as well. So eyes dotted, eyes dotted and T's crossed. We had a relationship with this person. would certainly not do this with somebody off the street. Right. But going back, there are a billion ways. That's the thing I love about real estate is I'm like a creative type, you know, and I like to just you know, let my creative juices flow. And that's, what's great about real estate is it's not a cut and dry plain Jane transaction. It's all, there's a lot of creativity, uh, that comes into the real estate world, uh, which I think is weird. I've only been in the real estate world for about three, three, four years. And people talk about real estate being creative. I'm like, it's really not, it's like numbers. And it's just that, but people will look at deals differently. They, they look yeah. at, you know, okay, hey, I'm, I'm going to change this property in this way. And another, you know, buying group may look at it completely different. And this is what I want to focus on. So, um, yeah, it is, it, there is definitely creativity in it and figuring out the right loan and the exit strategy and all that. Um, hey, talk about, you mentioned automating your business. You know, there's some people up, you know, that are listening that, they want to scale their business, so automation is a, is a key uh, area that they can focus on. So talk about some areas where you, you automated and it helped you. I Gladly. Um, and I think that, I mean, this book's kind of, I don't want to say it's fallen out of favor, um, but it doesn't meet a lot of today's new uh, entrepreneur. I say this with love, but a lot of our millennial friends out there, um, it doesn't match a lot of their desires. And that book is called The E-Myth. Um, and, uh, and that's 
because the e-myth talks about like in this my wife and i like built our company based on the e-myth um and that and, and it's still a great book but it, it actually means that the, the, the reason why a lot of people don't like it, or, or I, I don't think a lot of this, it's being applied as much as it should be, is that it, the EMF calls out that you're supposed to do all the jobs in your company yourself um, before you go and sub out or automate these things. And just put the hat on, try it, figure out the role, um, and then build a protocol around it and either you know, uh, hire it out or try and eliminate it altogether or do something to optimize that position. And just, you know, just because not, not everybody's as uh, zealous as you and I are, I guess, uh, that they don't want to do everything there is to do in their company before they push it off to automation or hiring things out, right? Yeah, um, yeah. there's a lot of people that have the, the viewpoint, which, uh, is, you know, who, not how, like, yes. who, you know, who, should, who should you hire? You know, who can you, you know, um, a lot of people are leveraging VAs, you know, a lot of different VAs to, to do tasks that, you know, are um, tasks that would bog them down and they can well, focus on higher return opportunities. Yes. But let's underline the last thing you just said, right? That's so they can focus on higher returning activities. And the e-myth talks about, yeah, understand the books of your company enough so that you can hand it off to a bookkeeper with a well-written protocol so that you can get out and be the entrepreneur, which is focusing on growth, fixing problems and growing your company, right? That's what you're really all about. There's some people that are automating so they don't have to work, you know, <laughs> right, right. Um, that are automating because they can, so they can just be lazy and just not, have to, not do anything, right? Right. Um, I believe in automation so I can live in my core genius to speak in the Dan Sullivan strategic coach language, yeah. right? God given talent, whatever you want to say, right? What I'm put on earth here to do, you know, my purpose. So right. if I can live further into that because of automation, uh, then I'm going to live a more successful, more fruitful, more profitable, more enjoyable life by doing what I enjoy doing. Right. Um, not so that I can sit on the beach and drink my ties or not work or whatever it may be. There is a, there is a not working myth right, right. that's, that's prevalent with the fire movement and everybody else that's out there in the world. Um, that, that there is a desire at some point to not have to work at all. I'd rather work, you know, as much as I'd like to, but only do what I'm only do my core genius. And I'll put in, you know, as many hours a week as I, as I choose to put in, if it's in my, you know, in something, in something that I'm great at, and not something that I hate. I think, I think people, a, people confuse that. They don't, they, don't, they just want to, they just want to do what they hate. Right. What they'd rather do is something they're great at. They don't want to not work. They right. want to do really what, what productive people want to do is to do something that, that I'm here to do. I'll, I'll gladly talk about all the automation we've done too. And I can talk you through that, but I'm sorry if I'm tangent. No, I mean, I think I it's right. great because like just yeah. the word retirement, you know, like yeah. re retirement, you know, I, I, you mentioned, um, whole life policies and leveraging that. And, and I had a life insurance guy and, you know, I, I set one up a few years ago and, and, um, he's like, when do you want to retire? And I'm like, you know what, with this multifamily thing, with this real estate thing, like, I don't really want to, like, I don't, you know, maybe I'm just going to be doing bigger deals and, you know, maybe fewer, fewer deals, but yeah. like, why not keep your brain working and why not help other people grow their wealth and teach other people how to, how to do it. And, you know, whatever floats your boat and whatever gets you charged up, you know, yeah. um, your core genius that you, you talked about, you know, you know what, Darren? I don't know any happy retired people, right? I don't, I know a lot of retired people. I do. And I, and, 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 uh, and that, but the ones that I know are not happy you know, um, because you lose purpose that way. And unless you've got a real big purpose, you can put yourself back into once you retire, then whatever that is, your grandkids, your kids, your grandkids, family, woodworking, uh, you know, watercolors, whatever it is, if you can get fulfillment from those things, perhaps. Um, but the problem that a lot of retired people have is they end up unfulfilled. Because people, it's a, it's an awful. People don't want to say this, but there is there is opportunity for joy and fulfillment from work. <laughs> yeah, and it's okay um, if you're if you're operating in your purpose and your core genius, whatever that is, then then you you will get fulfillment from it, and it's okay that you are. 
And I don't know if we're, I don't know if we're meant as a species to not work, to not be doing anything. Is your body thinks, okay, time to die now. Like I'll just, <laughs> I'll just fold it's up. It's so interesting um, because I'm the- not being utilized anymore. I will, I, 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 I will take this, uh, this empty shell of skin and put it away. You know, I would not, not need, not required anymore. The you know? concepts of, yeah. you know, financial freedom and time freedom are, are just bantered about. And that's what a lot of people are chasing, you know, but we got off a little bit on a tangent, but I think it's important that, look, you do those things so that you could spend time on the other, yeah. st- the stuff that you really want to. And hopefully yeah. part of that is, um, you know, is giving back, you know, to uh, yeah. helping others, um, learn down, from man. your success. You reach, and, the, you reach the mountains, have throw the rope down. Yeah. You know? And so um, you wrote, t- talk about why, why did you write the book? I mean, writing a book is a lot of work, you know, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of time. It's a lot of effort. You know, I'm, la- I'm laughing. I'm laughing, uh, Darren, because I had no idea how hard it was going to be <laughs> when I did it. Because <laughs> I had no idea. I didn't think like bigger pockets is like, hey, man, you want to write a book? I'm like, yeah, I'll write a book. Fine. That'd be great. I'll write a book. Uh, how hard could that be? <laughs> right. Um, right. And I used to write, uh, I, I, I still do sometimes write articles for them and everything like that. And um, they're just a great company to work with. Uh, and that, But I had done a lot of stuff with them in, in the past. And they're like, Hey, we really like to see you write something and all that. It's like, all right, cool. I'll do, I'll, I'll write that. I'll, I'll write a book. And so that, that was that topic raising, you know, raising private capital was the topic that came up and we had a bit, by the way, when you write a book, the name of the book is the last thing that happens, right? So for the longest time, that was just called Matt's book, you know, <laughs> and then when we, when we finally went down, the whole thing was drafted um, the, that's when raising private capital, the name came to the top, right? Um, and I wanted to call it the real estate rainmaker, but um, but they were like, yeah, John Grisham wrote a book called The Rainmaker that's like a New York Times bestseller, and you'll be lost in the noise of that. So we didn't call it rainmaker, which is a good idea. Um, nice. But I, I chose to do it only aside from like they thought they thought it'd be a good idea. Um, but you know what it is when I first got going. I figured a lot of these things out. I think there was not in 2005, there was not a book about how to raise money from your friends or how to like, there there was the antiquated books written in the eighties on how to invest in real estate, but there was nothing really modern on how to grow and scale a reasonable size real estate company. that was chock full of somebody's personal stories. Um, And so I wrote the book that I would have liked to have read when I first got going uh, because I wanted to help, you know, the, 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 the Matt, uh, the, the, the female and male version of Matt that's out there that just quit their just job. Just getting started. Wants, yeah. That wants a better way. That wants to learn how to do things. That wants to learn how to climb the mountaintop like I did and, and wants to grab the rope that I'm throwing down here with the book. And I'm not done climbing yet. I got a lot more climbing I want to do, but I still want to help people that are on their way up. And additionally, and this is like, now I, I'll touch a soapbox moment here, Darren. I believe that our financial system is has been broken for a long time and it's not made it's not designed to make Americans wealthy anymore right it's designed for fees and financial planners and you know sorry guys I'm I'm, I'm just the messenger here but um, but that that's just where our financial system is and we need other means for Americans to reach their financial goals and to reach their retirement goals um, and to be able to uh, you know, retire with a reasonable amount of money set aside so they can, you know, not have to work if they don't want to, you know, uh, or at least work a little bit less if they don't want to, or have something to hand down to their kids aside from a bunch of debt and, and, you know, broken, broken dreams and stuff like that. They hand something real in wealth in generational wealth down to their, down to their kids. Um, I believe that entrepreneurship, real estate investing, um, and, and other other outlets besides just real estate investing, but just entrepreneurship, things that are not Wall Street related, that are Main Street related, um, and investing in things that are around the corner from where you live, whatever it is, I believe that's the real financial future. And and I I think I firmly believe that what we do and what I can what my book teaches other people how to do um, is really making a real difference. And if you look back, if you get the video going back behind me on my, on my company logo, it says transforming lives through real estate. And I really mm. believe that what we do helps people change their lives, uh, their, their fiscal lives for our investors, 
the quality of life for our tenants, the purpose for the people that work for us, all those things, all in one big enchilada called Transforming Lives Through Real Estate. So and, that's really why I wrote the book is because I, I can create that. That's, with, that, that's fantastic. I can help people do that too. It's admirable and it's real. I mean, look, when I first got involved, I went and had a bunch of Starbucks meetings with a bunch of different syndicators and was like, is this real? And, yeah. and I couldn't believe people, were, how open people were like, Hey there, man, my, my net worth was 500,000 and now it's 5 million, yeah. you know, or another guy coming in. Hey, guess how much my net worth is? I'm like, I knew he was successful. So I, you know, guess a, a big number, eight, 9 million. He's like, you know, over 11 million. And like, it's just, you know, people that you, you know, not rock stars, you know, that are, you know, that these are people that have invested in multifamily. They took a chance and then they learned and they learned mm -hmm. how to go bigger and partner with more people and surround themselves with other people that are successful. Um, talk, talk about that. You talk about, um, you know, the people that you, you hang with and that you learn from. So talk, talk about that piece. Yeah, you never want to be the most successful person in the room. And I learned that I was that for a while. I was the most successful person in the room. But I found, I learned to find um, rooms of men and women that were way more successful than me. Um, and that's where I've done the most growing. And so I, my wife and I both joined an organization called GoBundance, um, which is a high net worth men's and women's organization. Um, and that I, uh, I, I tend to gravitate towards people that are a little bit off the beaten path, let's say, you know, people that have learned the uh, observe the masses and do the opposite or kind of like if all the fish are swimming to the left, might want to try to swim to the right um, kind of things. So I, I've learned as I can to surround. I mean, and obviously, I have people that I just hang out with, but uh, but the people that I really learn from that I try and like, you know, surround myself by as best I can are people that um just have tried on different things, risk takers, um, you know, that are willing to just keep banging their head on the head on the wall of success until they can get through um, in that. So that, that I, I do my best to surround myself by people like that. While I also throw the rope down to people that I, that I want to help pull up as many people as I can um, up to my level and beyond, you know, above me. <laughs> Absolutely. So it's, yeah. it goes both ways, right? You're helping the next guy and then hopefully you're putting yourself out there where you can learn from others. And, you know, I was going to ask you, well, where, you know, where do you meet those people? But you, you talked about it. You said you joined, you know, go abundance, a high net worth individual um, group. And there's all kinds of different mastermind groups out there um, that mm -hmm. you can get involved with. And, and for the, you know, many times, it's a financial investment, right? To, to get involved with one of these groups. They um, almost always are because that's, right. that's, a, that's the way you, you make sure people are serious. Um, they're accountable. They, they, they get, they pay money. They're going to, they're going to take some action hopefully. Um, yeah. And so now you're surrounded with other people that have done things that are bigger than what you've done. And yeah. um, that, you know, so it becomes one idea can way, way, way more overpay for the, whatever it costs to join. Right. Yeah. And, that, and people don't realize that. And now like, well, why would I pay $10,000, $20,000, whatever, to be a part of a mastermind or whatever you don't realize, man, like with one, with one change of mindset, if it can increase your cash flow by that much per month or create or increase your net worth by a hundred X of that number, but is it guaranteed? Um, no. <laughs> That's what the is? thing. There's some people that want that guarantee, right? But what is, you know? Right. Like, what, what is guaranteed in life, man? I mean, like death and taxes, that's about it, you know? I mean, but I can tell you that by the track record, all I needed to hear for something like GoBundance, whatever mastermind you refer to, give me a few people that are members of it. And they'll tell you, yeah, man, listen, this ain't going to be easy. But if you apply the principles you get here and work really hard, you'll get 10, 50, 10, 10 to 50 X success of what you, of what your investment is. That's all I need to hear. Okay. So you mean if I work it, it'll work for me. Okay. Right. I'm in. Um, that's a, that, but guaranteed, you know, that's such a BS word. You know, I mean, that means that means I don't have to work. 
I don't have to do anything right. and you'll just do it all for me. And you'll, and if I, and if it doesn't work out cause I didn't try very hard, you'll give me my money back. Right. You know? <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. You know, it's, so there's some people that ask me about multifamily mentorship groups and if they have that kind of attitude, I'm like, you know, the best way I could describe it is when I see a bunch of new members come in, I kind of liken it to the 80, 20 rule. Like, you know, look, mm-hmm. are you, are you in your past life in your, you know, jobs and careers and do you rise up, you know, to the top 20%? Do you find a way, do you kick fight and scratch? Then you're going to do the same thing and you'll figure it out and you'll be successful. But if you just want it handed to you, save your money and don't do it because yeah. you, you just, it's not going to be just handed to you. And there's good ones or bad ones out there. I mean, there, there's good masterminds, bad masterminds and stuff like that. There's people that are, that are doing masterminds so they can get a big check and they're doing masterminds because they want to throw a rope down and make a difference. Right. right. Um, and, and so don't get me wrong. There, there are ones out there. Um, not, not every mastermind that's high dollar like that is worth every penny. Um, but once you find one and you're willing to hustle and push and, and, uh, and drive through it to get it to, to create the value and implement the lessons, then it's really on you. You know, um, it's really on you and people don't want to hear that. But like at the beginning of the, a lot of these things, you hear people say like, Hey, listen, 20% of you are actually going to do something with this education. You know, how crazy would that be if my, um, you know, my eight year old at the beginning of school, uh, if his, if his second grade teacher stood up in front of the room and said, Hey, listen, right. 20% of you are actually going to pay attention and listen and apply what I'm teaching right now. The other 80% of you are going to learn what I'm teaching you a couple of years from now when you're playing catch up in fifth grade. You know, <laughs> yeah, um, but it's they don't true typically of say that today at the young ages. I've heard teachers say that. My father in law was a teacher for 40 years, and he said, You know, you used to walk in the room and hope that you were able to make a difference in every child's life in that room, in all 30 of them, right? What, what I came to realize after about 10 years, I mean, he was a teacher for 40 years. He said, After about year 10, I realized that I'd be that if I could touch like the lives of one to two of the 30 then that was about right. That's about wow. what was, what, what real probability was. Isn't that, I mean, you say awful or whatever, but it's just the way it is, right. you know? I mean, and so, but that, that all, that, that's all got to do with effort and got to do with, and, and just the, the student being, <laughs> the teacher appearing when the student's ready uh, and, inside uh, as well. But if you're that, if you're that person in the room, do your best to be in the 20 percentile by hustling and applying and listening and asking questions and putting your hand in the air and ma- ma- trying to get as much squeeze as much as you can out of those experiences. Absolutely. So I just ordered a book and I can't remember the name of it and what it was, but I remember there was a tagline on it. It was recommended by somebody and, and it said, um, the tagline was that anyone can do it, but most won't. <laughs> and yeah. that's kind of what we're talking about. Like, you know, it's, it's like, there's so much out there, to teach people, but most people won't do it. So, Hey, you talked about, um, throwing a rope down and making a difference. You have done a lot of different things. Um, so, Mm -hmm. you know, we talked a lot about your book, um, but you also have a YouTube channel, you you know, talk about all the different components where you're throwing, you know, that's an effort, social media. Those are efforts to throw a rope down and educate somebody that hasn't done it before. And, you know, um, some people, um, don't throw that line down, but you do, you do, you throw it out in a lot of different areas. So talk about that. I'd like to be doing more of it. Um, I'd like to be transitioning to more of, um, you know, as as our company continues to elevate and I've got more and more a plus people around me. So I don't, I'm not washing the bottles and and that kind of thing in my company anymore. (laughs) You know, like there's a lot of CEOs like I am the chief in charge, you know, chief executive and janitor, janitor and bottle washer. Well, luckily, I'm able to give a lot of that, you know, stuff up that I'm not great at and that. So as I grow, I'd like to do more give back, which will probably mean to your question, things like, um, you know, give back education. I'd love to do some entrepreneur. I'd love to like go to a local community college by me and just teach a, a class to the college to, to, to college uh, kids about entrepreneurship, real, um, you, you know, battle scar, uh, story level, uh, you know, uh, entrepreneurship lessons and things like that. So that's on my, that's on, a, on, on my couple of year list that I'd like to do as well. But we already did, we do a lot of charitable donations. Um, uh, my wife and I do, we have a division of our company called DeRosa Gives, 
um, where we do uh, company-based donations and things like that. Um, I do, as you said, YouTube, but a lot of what I put on YouTube is stuff that could be charged for, but it's out there for free. You're just going to watch a five-second commercial, uh, hit the skip ad button, and then you can watch the education we have there. Um, and that, and we, we give a lot of what we do away. Uh, and, and it's just, it's, it's because we love it. We want to help people. My, my wife, I, I should mention the real estate invest her, uh, which is about, uh, documenting, highlighting and empowering the journey of the real estate, uh, female. Um, she, uh, does a lot of give back and throwing a rope down on her side too. Fantastic. Fantastic. Yeah. Um, so what's the next big stretch goal for you? Um, I'd like to increase our unit count. I mean, not just because I'm going to pound my chest like King Kong or anything like that, but because I believe that we make a difference as the, as, uh, our, our properties, um, rarely have lots of move outs. If they, if our vision is implemented properly, um, we have one of the, some of the stickiest properties that are out there that people just don't want to move from. So I want to acquire more so I can, you know, create great living environments and create great investments for our investor base. Um, I probably got two, maybe three more books, uh, in, in the hopper, oh, I got oh, one wow. of the works right now. Um, in that <laughs> second book's always a lot easier than the first book, Darren. Uh, <laughs> Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I oh, guess yeah. it didn't scare you away. It was a lot of work, you know, uh, but it didn't scare you away. You want to do another one, so I enjoyed it. Yeah. Well, there, there was days where I hated that book, but there was days where I loved. There, most days I loved it, and I'm grateful that I did it because I put a lot of my soul into it. Um, but um, there's, we have a, uh, my wife and I have a few more that we're working on right now. Fantastic. Um, so unit count thirteen fifty mm-hmm. now. What's the, what's the what's the number you're shooting for, and wh- and by when? Um, no, we'd like to be at five thousand in the inside inside the next five years. Um, smart organic growth, not too fast growth. We'd like to get into new construction. I think we can get really really creative and come up with some really really unique living spaces that are that are just fun and next level. Um, Air cool awesome. the future. What um, markets do you focus on? We're in North Carolina and Kentucky and Pennsylvania too. Sorry. Uh, I, I also own in New Jersey, but we're not looking to buy any more here. So, um, yeah, so that's a, uh, yeah, North Carolina and Kentucky and a little bit of Pennsylvania, some certain parts of Pennsylvania are our target markets for the foreseeable future. So. You know, it's so funny. Like, okay, so you have 1350 units. Now you have a goal to get to 5,000 within five years. Mm-hmm. When you first started doing small little real estate deals. Did you ever think that you were going to have a goal of having 5,000 apartment I, units? I probably could say that and, and, and say like, Oh yeah, absolutely. Darren. I, you know, of course I thought I didn't know that was possible. And I, you know, it's fun. It, it's hard to um, think about just possibility on what your realm of possibility was back then. Like what I think is possible now you know, is, is probably not even true versus where I'm, where, where I think that I might get to 10, 15, 20 years from now, where I think that what possibility looks like, you know, it's one of the, it's, it, I think that we just don't, there, there's all, there's only a horizon that we can see ahead in our lives of what we believe is possible. Like if you were to ask Winston Churchill at 10 years old, where he thought he would be when he was 40, you know, the realm of possibility of what he saw for his life is probably only out to a certain horizon. Right. Um, and so, so I, I would, I think I would agree with that. But I, the other yeah. thing I would say though, is that, you know, the difference between people that I think that have achieved, you know, great success and, and achieved huge goals is that they took action and achieved whatever their horizon was back then. Yes. And then once they, they got there, they, they pushed the horizon out further. Yeah. To a new At some goal. point, they realize, and they could have been a different person earlier in life. Winston Churchill maybe wasn't the person at ten years old that he, that he was, in, you know, when he went uh, later in life, right? But the uh, the point is, is that at some point I made the decision, and I was not always like this. At ten years old, I didn't know I would be doing what I'm doing now, right? Or that I would be like trying as an entrepreneur to try and build and create this thing that's that's larger than me. But at some point, I decided to, and at some point, I decided, you know, I'm going to take this life called this life card I've been dealt and I'm going to take it for a whirl and try as hard as I can and do my absolute best and believe in myself and not allow set not to call setbacks failures and to not quit just keep going and I've had so many times there and I've had my teeth kicked in I've been knocked down I got back up 
And it's when I made the decision to do those things and to push as hard as I can and grow as hard as I can that 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 possibility horizon that I'm referring to got a lot wider all of a sudden. I'm like, well, I guess I could do that. I guess I could, you know, buy a, you know, 200 unit apartment building. Oh, geez, I just bought a 200 unit. And I guess I could scale to a thousand if I wanted to. And then I've done that, you know, and we're over a thousand now. It's like, I can see where 5,000 sits from right. where I'm standing. I mean, do I see where 50,000 like Sam Zell level is from where I'm standing? Is that inside my event, possible, my event, possibility, my possible, you know, possible sure. horizon? No, not yet. But it, it could be if I grow and expand to that point. I mean, it's not my desire right now. Right. Um, but I think that I'm going to keep doing as you keep referring to, keep taking action, doing my best, and uh, keep looking to become a higher version of myself each day and each year. And and let's see where it goes from there. And and that's the best I can do. And people forget that. They want to just do one deal and smack it to the, they want to hit a grand slam home run their first swing at the ball right and they don't realize that major league baseball players strike out 70 percent of the time yeah the other, the other <laughs> thing i would i would say is yeah. like look when you were first starting out you were probably focused on what, what what's your wife's name liz liz you're you're probably focused on building the wealth of you you know for your family you and liz and your your family and mm -hmm. then as you became more successful you know, you started throwing the rope down, you know, yeah. and, and right now there's listeners that are listening to you and they're like, they're thinking they just want to get their first deal to build the wealth of their family, but they, they can't see down the path that they actually have the opportunity to throw the rope down to other people, you know, two, three, four years from now and teach you them. Know what though? I'll go even, I'll go even better everybody's got the chance to throw the rope down. And Liz yeah. and I started doing that a long time ago, just because this is who Liz and I are. Liz and I just want to help people. And, and that's another reason why I'm doing this is not so I can have a Lamborghini or so I can have a better car or so I can have a better house or, or not work or an airplane or whatever it is. It's so I can live a great prosperous life, but also help as many people as I can and make, make the lives of other people as best as I can. And so I, Liz and I, I'm not like pounding our chest here or whatever. We've always been throwing down the rope. Um, let's see, two or three weeks after we got married, um, uh, hurricane, uh, Katrina came through, um, through new Orleans and ravaged new Orleans. Right. We went to new Orleans for a week. Uh, wow. Liz and I did right after we got married, we two were like two broke 20 somethings, you know? Um, and we went and found a way uh, to go to New Orleans for a whole week. And we just covered ourselves in spackle every day, spackling up people's houses in the, uh, in the St. Bernard parish Good for uh, you, and man. everything like that. So everybody's got a chance to throw the rope down and whether you've got the opportunity to write a big check or give some of your time or just give some attention to someone who needs it or whatever it is, we've all got something to give. And I encourage everybody to give, give, give what you can. Doesn't always have to be a check. Right. That's, that's a great, 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 great point. Yeah. Um, hey, what do you like to do outside of work? Um, I used to make wine. I'd like to get back into that, but I moved to a new home. And in my new home, I don't have neighbors that are into making wine. I used to have winemaking neighbors where I lived in New Jersey, but we moved to Pennsylvania and I've yet to meet good winemaking people. So I'd like to get back into that. That was my hobby for years. Um, <clears throat> I do a lot of physical stuff like taking care of my body. Um, you know, running, biking, um, you know, I do a lot of outdoorsy, outdoorsy stuff with my family. I ski in the wintertime. Um, where do you ski up in like Vermont or Pennsylvania? So we go to, we go to the poke, we go to like little, uh, you know, um, goosebump mountains. Yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah. I grew up in Connecticut and we would go up to Vermont and it's, uh, you go to some good spots. Yeah. Well, we, it's, yeah, it's, we, they're great mountains, but it's, you know, it's cold and it's yeah, like, boy. it's typically man made snow a lot, you know, that is blowing on you going up the trail versus going to Colorado, Utah. You, you get spoiled, you know? Yeah, I know. I've um, been out there too. I've skied, uh, I've skied a few spots in Colorado. I've skied Canada too. Um, it's incredible. You can't, I mean, you know, that's where, that, that's where skiing is, is, is real, but it's good enough. Yeah. Um, and I'm trying to get my son into it and everything like that. But the bottom line, Darren, I spend a lot of time with my family, uh, my kids. I've got a seven year old and a four year old. Um, 
I, I called him eight earlier because he turns eight in like a month and he's already rounding himself up to eight. Like when you, when, when you ask my seven year old how old he is, he did his full sentence is I'm seven, almost eight. <laughs> yeah. That's how old I'll tell you. That's so great. I, one of my biggest hobbies is spending time with my kids. Fantastic. So, uh, hey, ha- if somebody wants to reach out to you, what's sure. the best way to do it? Everything is on my website. The book that we talked about, the uh, in any type of education that we offer, links to my YouTube, links to my wife's uh, podcast is all there at derosagroup.com, D-E-R-O-S-A group.com, derosagroup.com. Fantastic. Well, Matt, appreciate you spending the time. Uh, listeners, I hope you enjoyed that one. Until next week, sign off. Thank you for watching Darren Batchelder's Real Estate Investing Show. If you liked the episode, please click the like button and subscribe to the show. If you already are subscribed, then thank you. And please share the show with a friend. Check out other free resources at darrenbatchelder.com slash learn. 